folks, welcome to another episode of Arcane Assist. I'm Rebecca, joined this week by Evan again. And we are playing a what's the scenario is called, I think, Bunkers. Bunkers. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm playing a, an Arcadius list that I've been really excited to bring to the channel for a little while now. And Evan is playing Resnick 2. Is that right? Yeah, I'm bringing Resnick 2. Uh, funny enough, we've had this matchup on the channel before, but these are very different lists. <laughs> they absolutely are. Uh, yeah, both casters have evolved pretty significantly. And I think also the game has evolved pretty significantly. This is the first match on the channel we've had that's featured. Featured archons in a really major way. Mm -hmm. um, so we have we have four archons on the table in this particular matchup. Uh, two in my list and two in Evan's list, uh, which I think probably is a good opportunity to go over the lists that we're playing. Yeah. All right. I Take us into it. I will start with Resnick, uh, who has a battle group of his best bud, Scourge of Heresy, as well as a Templar and two Reckoners. Uh, he also has a Hierophant as a requisition option. Uh, Reckoners have pretty sweet guns that are fire damage typed, which go really great with the two Menite Archons we've got on the list that have the awesome rule that you may know from Hand of Judgment called Fuel for the Flames. When a model suffers a fire damage roll, within five inches of this model, add plus two to the roll. So, thus far, Reckoner's guns are at POW 16. It gets better. So, uh, if you're shooting an enemy model within five inches of a Menite Archon, you also have Sevy one or zero zero. Sevy zero. Yep. Providing, I have Menos, so that brings that gun to POW seventeen. He's got his friend the Repenter, which also has a fire gun. That's a little bit less POW, but still pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then we also have Battle from the Choir, which brings us to a whopping POW nineteen range twelve gun that is also at Rat six from Sevy. Uh, if you aim as Rat eight, and if you hit with the other one first. They have minus two defense. There's a lot of things in here. Potentially curse, too. Like, curse P is a big factor. Yep. yep. Potentially curse. So th these Reckoner guns can get to stupid levels if you want or need them to. Um, so it's a hyper-accurate, really high-damaging gun line that can transform into, like, a really forceful melee brick. Exactly. Uh, we've also got two vassals as a requisition option. Uh, as previously mentioned, we have Sevi Zero with a Repenter. We've got a Vassal Mechanic. We've got a Rack. We have a Maximum Unit of Choir, as well as Roven and Co. So, uh, yeah. I figured out by now, we're in Creator's Might. We're in Creator's Might. Uh, so, yeah, the, the Mana Archons bring a lot to the theme. Um, they're very interesting with a lot of your jack options. Uh, also really cool in this theme, they increase the damage on Resnick's feet, because Resnick's feet is fire damage. So it goes from about 14 to 16 with the explosions, which means it's actually start damaging heavies at that point, which is pretty sweet, because it also gets the benefit of Sevy Zero. So your blast damage from your feet, or well, your your damage from your feet, because it's not blast, is about mm -hmm. 17. Uh, yeah. Pretty good stuff. Yeah, it's a really, really effective feat. Can clear a ton of material. Um, it's a, I think there's a lot to like here. Uh, for my part, I'm playing Arcadius. Uh, this is a list largely inspired by, if not nearly exactly the same as one sent to me by Liam, who is much better at piloting than I am. Hey, Liam, if you're watching this video, I apologize for the way I'm playing this list. Everyone else, this is how you play Arcadius, and this should look really impressive from a distance. Uh, the list is Arcadius with Targ, Targe, the man, the myth, the legend. I have a Gorax Rager, two Gun Boars, two Roadhogs, two Warhogs, two Void Arkans, uh, Hermit, Boomhowler Solo Artist, Quack and Gub, Gatorman Witch Doctor, and a Gremlin Swarm. Uh, that Gremlin Swarm could probably be unpacked into a Gobber Chef and a um, Swamp Grepper Bellows crew, uh, but I didn't do that because I felt like... Uh, what was the rationale? Sorry, uh, I, I wanted something that gave me a source of... Um, uh, like something that I could fairly easily throw away to, to be like a beacon target for the feet. Um, but I think in retrospect, if we weren't playing bunkers, it would be more useful to have something that could square, score a circle. Uh, I selected treasure chest as my objective, and you picked... The Pathfinder one. Pathfinder. Very nice. Cool. Uh, so without further ado, we'll jump right into the game. Sounds good. So Evan won the die roll. Uh, when you elected to go first, right? Yes, I did. Yeah, so um, given the side that you picked, the the reason I took the side that I'm on, I felt like that obstruction in the zone would be a pretty convenient place for me to hide sort of Arcadius potentially and sort of key support pieces from, you know, charging or some gunshots. Let's me play fairly far forward while also being pretty well screened. Uh, and I thought the combination of the building and the wall would dictate fairly aggressively that Severius, or pardon me, would dictate fairly aggressively that Resnick would have to be on the, the topmost side of the board. Any uh, 
What comments no, about your deployment here? Make, makes sense to me. Um, I wanted to go first because going against Arcadius means that he threats basically the entire table. So if you ever want to be able to leave your half of the table, you have to go first. <laughs> Arcadius is very, very scary in some ways, but also we're playing Feral Beasts, so they're made out of wet cardboard. So Indeed. It's a, you know, it's a mixed bag. I feel like um, when you're playing pieces that threat really, really far and are very fragile, uh, that have a lot of flexibility, uh, it really does demand that you be experienced and confident with the list. Uh, and you will see from this matchup that I am confident, but perhaps not experienced. Is that the, the right way to assess things here? <laughs> uh, I, I pull some cute tricks, and I think, you know, dig into the toolbox a little bit, but any incredibly proficient Arcadius player is going to be able to get beyond this. And I, I believe that given time, there'd be even more to, to unlock. One of the, the sort of neat puzzles of Arcadius is that so few things can keep up with him. And Liam focuses on uh, a sort of more Pharaoh oriented battle group to be able to capitalize more effectively on the feet and the battle group specific abilities that he has. Uh, that means you don't get some of the quality pieces like Dolly and Scarith or Rungai and Snapjar or Rorsch and Brine that are very, very powerful in the Will Work for Food Minions theme. But it means that you obviously get more capitalization on Arcadius's power. And you know, Dolly and Scarith and Rorsch and Brine, e even the Ninja Pig can sometimes fail to keep up with Arcadius's threat ranges in battle group. Um, but the Void Archons often can uh, because they have the ability to, you know, charge something, spray something else, teleport into range. Like, they've, they've got a lot of tools to uh, to really be quite flexible with that Void Walk. So, uh, starting on my turn, the plan is just to, to get up in a pretty aggressive position where we can start making use of our guns in the next turn. The Mennonite Archons are nice and safe right now, so they're just going to take as much of a flank as they can, and then they can come in from the sides later and start wreaking some havoc. They're really good combat solos that have a little bit of support to them with the feel for the flames, but for the most part, they just want to get in there and hit stuff. And they do it oh so well. And they do it oh so well. Uh, so we move up the Templar, put a Vassal right behind. Um, we've, we've basically deployed all of our, our infantry as a big support blob. Like, they're just... Almost every infantry model in this list is a support piece, except for the two shield guards that come with Roven and Co., because they're also just weapon master halberds that are blessed. You could argue that shield guards are support of a sort. I mean, sure, they still have support elements to them, but also they are weapon masters. Um, they get to start with Death March out in this theme, so I have vengeance on those shield guards as well, which is nice. We well, like uh, a Pharaoh Valkyrie in it. A little bit. I mean, only two shield guards, though. Yeah, I, my experience in uh, the Game 4 machine is things are often compared to Pharaoh and found to be lacking. <laughs> it's strictly untrue. Um, but yeah, Templar and Scourge of Heresy to the top side of the table. Reckoners screaming down the middle. Repenter on the bottom side. Archons on either side. And we've got our support kind of bunched up in the back with a vassal on the top side and the bottom. Yeah, the... Um Threat ranges on, on the things in this list are quite long. I'm looking at the uh, the Archons, threat, I think 13. The the Reckoners themselves shoot 17, potentially. Um, they don't have Assault. That's a, that's a Mark II rule. But they do have the ability to walk 5 and shoot 12. So that's that's pretty scary. And the sort of varietals of buffs that I've been described. If Arcadius goes pretty low on Fury, they could just kill him in that range. So I'm, uh, I'm trying to remain cognizant of those things. Fair enough. Those are good things to remain cognizant of. How's the how's the first turn planning going? Well, uh, it's a, it's it's always a puzzle. Like there's a lot of things going on in this list, and I'm just I'm trying to make sure that I'm well prepared for the next turn. So we start with Quack and Gub. They go first, and they put out uh, Enliven. Um, get to uh, Enliven twice, um, and the Gator Witch Doctor puts out the the Ghost Walk. Um, both those models are amphibious, so they've deployed kind of opposite the little piece of shallow water here and with ghost walk the warhog can go pretty far up the board um we're gonna go next with that's that's one of the enliven targets the other one's the roadhog uh the roadhog runs up the board and it gets up behind this little piece of wall my thought here is that you know there's a lot of things evan has that he could commit to these pieces um including the ability to 
like send a reckoner in right away on one of them or just take a bunch of shots at it. And my hope is that I don't just like lose a heavy on the approach to his incredibly strong and powerful guns. It's the thing I'm most anxious about. I send up the other Warhonk. These guys are all just running. Run the Gorax up behind the uh, the building here. Gorax is fairly safe. I want him laid as a support piece. I run the other Void Archon up, so it's getting the benefit of cover. Both Void Archons have got cover that takes them to a, a healthy defense 18, and I think that's a fine place for them. Run the gun bore. I stay out of 13 inches with the other gun bore. It runs up here. And mostly this is just a turn that's kind of built on unpacking, kind of putting in pieces in position where they can kind of threaten Evan's stuff, but they're not necessarily just going to seed the alpha entirely. Um, trying to project fairly wide. Arcadius himself is going to advance into range such that he can cast Forced Evolution, puts up Guardian Beast, and I take one away from the Gorax and I Psychosurgery it back. The Gorax has got one damage taken now, and Arcadius is on one Fury at the end of the turn here. I take a couple of seconds thinking about it, but decide that's what I want to do. Um, that's, I mean, I could have dropped two and not been camping any, um, but I feel like camping one sort of as an emergency plan, just in case something happens that I wasn't expecting, uh, is a better way to have my Fury out on the board. Maltreatment. It's pretty cool. By abusing animals, you can manage Fury. Yay. <laughs> In my defense, uh, they're they're horribly, horribly tortured and mutated animals. That's so much better. I feel so much better now. Oh, good. I'm glad. Uh, I just run Boomhauer a little bit more centrally because I feel like I kind of deployed him badly. So he's he's fixed in post, as they say. Uh, that Kremlin's from up top is ready to go take a flag if that man eye archon moves away. <laughs> <laughs> so... Looking at the table, I see that there's a, a Warhog in my face. I'm fairly confident it can put a good amount of damage into it. I want to shoot it with the Repenter first to trigger Enliven. Then once it's gotten Enliven gone, I can just light it up with Reckoners or even charge it if need be um, and just put a, a world of hurt into it. Uh, Spell Piercer means I can ignore Forced Evolution fairly easily. So I don't have to worry about the extra defense. So yeah, we're just gonna try to to light it up, see what happens. We're not gonna throw a Menite Arc on at it per se because we're really like trying to preserve pieces for after the feat. Because once the feat has been blown, there's basically it's just a grand melee. Like we're we're all in at that point, and if. If I lose too much on that turn, then the game is over. So we're just going to play fairly conservatively. We're going to let Becca score fairly heavily on this turn. Like, we're only just going to throw a little bit to contest so that she has to work for it a little bit. But other than that, we're not going to try too hard to get to the opposite side of the table and contest because we don't have a lot of models that can get that fast. Anyways, because we're playing men off. You're just going to focus on being a gun line this turn? Exactly. Stay back. Play safe. Play like a gun line. There's this awesome little part uh, with this obstruction where I can be completely out of line of sight and also contesting the flag, which is nice. The other great part about this list is that most of it's immune to fire, so Roadhog sprays aren't great against it. Uh, That's true. Both Menite Archons and both Reckoners are immune to fire, so like just... That, that little bit of extra damage that Roadhogs would typically get on their target, they're not going to. Ashen Veil on everything's nice, too. Like, Meta Archons have insane defensive stat lines, with especially if they get their Righteous Vengeance because they go to 13 with Ashen Veil, uh, and then also 19 plus 2 from Righteous Vengeance makes them 21. So they're potentially 15, 21 solos, which is just absurd. With what, like 12 or 15 boxes? 15 boxes. It's pretty good. Uh, so we plant the Templar within 4 inches of that flag. I'm fairly confident that this Templar isn't going to get killed, so that flag is not going to get scored anytime soon unless Becca wants to commit so much to that top side of the table that it's just worth it to me. Repenter goes up for a spray on this Warhog. 
We get our plus two from battle, our plus one from Sevi. We just need to hit and plink it for one damage, so I boost to hit. Uh, haven't given it any extra focus. Probably should have from Sevi, but I didn't. Uh, and then we roll damage. Uh, we don't include a location die on our first roll, despite it being very good. <laughs> um, so our our second roll be, is a three, which does no damage to the Warhog and does not trigger Enliven. Yeah, Enliven requires damage to be taken to uh, to effect, so we do not proc Enliven off this first attack, which is good for me because it means you have to basically seed more resources into it. Indeed. The Reckoner boosts to hit a shot, hits, and you choose to Mad Visions it from the Hermit. Yep. So that you have not, you still have not yet proc Enliven. And at that point, I'm like, I don't want to just give this Warhog extra threat range. I'm going to shoot the one that doesn't have Enliven next. Probably the right call. And I will move up a little bit with the other Reckoner that has not activated. I'm going to just kind of try to hard roll the six. Yeah, because at this point, you're looking for, for damage. Yeah, at this point, I just, I just want to ch chip damage, do something. Um, and I do more than chip damage. I choose not to boost. I shoot it, needing a six to hit, thanks to good old Sevi zero. And then I boost damage and blast it for ten damage to the one, knocking out its mind. Pretty nice. Good start. So with that, we've we've already moved up everything on the top side of the table. The Vassal gave Scourge an extra focus, just in case we want to do some arcane vortexing if anything decides to target the Templar, or Scourge, or even my caster. Uh, although Lamentation is up, so if we want to get that close, it's probably going to be double the cost anyways, which is even better with Arcane Vortex. I feel like Vortex. a double cost Crippling Grasp that you then Arcane Vortex is a pretty solid swing for you. Yeah. That's like, that's that's a six Fury investment for nothing. So, Menite Archons are going to pull back. Um, again, I want to keep them alive until they can do work later in the game. I'm going to keep the bottom one within five inches of that vassal mechanic because that would mean that I get swift vengeance if I do, or if that one is killed. The other one up top just steps in the way so that there can't be any weird, janky, frenzy, go after Resnick and kill me on top of two nonsense, or bottom of two in this particular case. But yeah, none of that's happening. Nuh uh. uh so off to you. Hmm. I just forgot an important feature of this game that we made a small mistake on. I'll uh, bring it to our viewers' attention in a moment. But uh, there, were, there were a couple of dice rolls where we factored a, a particular detail wrong, but that's okay. Um, we, can, uh, we can still acknowledge it and, uh, and show the rest of the game, which I think is quite good. Um, yeah, this is a small mistake. So uh, there's a couple of choices that I'm going to make here in a second. Um, I'm going to my focus this turn is basically to score as aggressively in scenario as I can. Uh, I'd like to do a bunch of damage to Evan's pieces, maybe remove some things, but my focus is going to be to remove everything that contests a flag, contest his zone, and score four points. I'm gonna. My hope is to go f up four to zero, and then be able to you know leverage that into a scenario victory later in the the game. So we advance Boomhaller first, uh, whose primary role in this list is actually just to give Repo 3 to the Hermit, so I can dig a little deeper with Ruin. Uh, he does that. He calls that out as a fell call, and he generates some shots with his chain gun. Shoots the little shield guard friend who's up fairly centrally there, and he hits and does a truckload of damage, and uh, gets four shots. Uh, I think all but one of them here hit, and they collectively kill. They do all eight damage boxes, which is not bad for dice minus six. Uh, they trigger some vengeance attacks yes. on the uh, So archons. the bottom Archon gets both the Swift Vengeance and Righteous Vengeance. The top Archon only gets Righteous Vengeance. So both of them are currently plus two strength, plus two arm, but only the bottom one's going to get to move on my maintenance phase. So our uh, Hermit uh, advanced his five inches, uh, did Ruin, and then he repoed three inches. He is on the flag. He is my scoring solo at this stage. Uh, he's tagged... Um, the jack, two two of the jacks, should I say. That's the, the important part. Uh, the Void Archon advances. He kills the mechanic, and he does not get to collect its soul because of the Menite Archon. Who Menite Archon, Soul him. Ward. But he does still get to Void Walk, so he gets to do a fancy little teleporty thing. Um, I consider teleporting deeper and just like attacking Menite Archons or like putting damage rolls into the jack or putting Dark Shred out there, but I don't really have great threat range for it, and I just want to save my Void Archon and score this flag. So now I've got two flags, uh, 
clear or nearly clear. There's still a Jack contesting the center one. Um, and I have uh, two solos to score them. So, so far the plan is working. Uh, the Roadhog advances. It boosts to hit a spray and boosts damage on this as the Repenter. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes, so the is. Repenters, this dice down three. And I don't do great, but I do four points of damage and light them up. Yeah, Repenters are, are really good now. Uh, as a, They're an eight-point jack. Typically, you would just take a Dervish because it's only seven points with, with 70 zero. But um, Repenter with Road to War as extra threat and then now the plus two extra damage from the Menite Archon yeah. really make it an appealing option if you just want to drop a rack for it because I would typically take two racks and a dervish in this list and instead of now I'm taking one rack and a repenter and I'm just saving that rack for a pivotal turn um, and the repenter just gets to do some some nice work with a spray eight it's also um, one of the things I think is appealing about it is just the 12 17 stat line is really really durable yeah like it's yeah. a it's a sturdy light that can really hang out for a long period of time that's not really like a point over the uh, the dervish it's just one of the things I think is is quite solid about it uh, the Void Archon moves up, takes a shot, and with its POW 14 damage, it, it does a real solid chunk of damage to that uh, Repenter. for damage. Ow. Pretty all right. Not bad for a piece that I considered just running to give Dark Shroud. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so the Roadhog I don't activate yet. Um, I did take the sort of backmost Warhog and just kind of run it. It's uh, its mind is crippled, but I ran it um, into range to be uh, friend to frenzy onto that Templar. I'm looking to to do a bunch of damage to the Templar. So Targ moves up, um, has the gun board take a shot. Uh, the gun board does. I I don't think any damage. It's just minus eight. Yeah, not not great. The it's Templar is pretty hardy. Yeah, yeah, it, it absolutely is. Um. I give a little ghostliness to the um, the Roadhog, uh, and I go up and I enliven both of them. Looking, uh, like, I, I think the uh, the Ghost Walk on it is actually probably not necessary from the uh, the Croc Doc because he's already activated and he's going to end up taking a bit of a weird vector that's not going to get him where he needs to go in terms of frenzying. But sort of trying to think about a couple of different things at once. Uh, this is a gun bore shot that hits. And does pretty decent damage to the uh, the Repenter, who I think is now on three or four boxes. And the Gorax casts Primal onto the Warhog. Mm -hmm. Increasing its mat to eight. A surprisingly important distinction in this matchup. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gunbar walks up and actually just misses the Templar. Uh, its blast scatters off into nowhere, so no no high explosive damage. High explosive damage in the back, uh, ignoring the shield, is actually almost as good as its direct hit, but I miss both of them anyway. Uh, Arcadius advances, and he moves up so that the Templar is in his control area. Uh, his feet's weird. Um, everything in his battle group uh, can frenzy. Um, doesn't have to be in his control area to frenzy. And then... He gets to pick the target if the target of choice, the enemy model, is in his control area. So I've moved up to have that Templar in range because I want to be able to pick it as the frenzy target for some of my pieces. Um, so I do a psycho surgery uh, after maltreating, I think, I can't remember if it's the Gorax or something else. Please I maltreat the Roadhog. Road I maltreat the Roadhog. Yeah, so he, he pulls back in a bunch of fury. Um, and uh, he's now on four. Has Guardian Beast upkept, has Force Evo upkept. Um, I, I, I have a couple of choices here. I debate putting in a Primal Shock. Um, and I'm trying to remember what I decided. I think I decided to just camp the four. And then we feet. And the Warhog charges directly toward the Templar. And I get to remove its Fury because it is frenzying. Uh, it hits the Psycho Surgery, healed its mind. Um, highest Pow Attack, which is the Cleaver. Gets an attack with a cleaver, which is unfortunately taste minus five. Does a few points. Uh, the um, gun board charges next. Uh, same thing. Gun board gets three days to hit. It certainly does. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I think it actually misses. Yeah, it misses with a three. Yeah, it misses with a, a, a two, one, one, which is um, four. a four. So that's a nine. Templars are def 10, I think. Yeah. Uh, the Roadhog uh, frenzies toward the Templar, and it falls short, but it's going to activate later in the turn, which you can do with Arcadius's feet, and then it's going to be able to go in there and do some work on that Templar. Uh, who hasn't taken a ton of damage? So maybe this plan was a bit too ambitious. We'll see. 
Uh, the Warhog goes next. If it frenzies on the Repenter, it'll stop when it hits the wall, which is... Um, the Roadhog uh, is ghostly. It charges the Repenter. We'll get into contact with it. We'll still not have cleared the wall and shunts back, so we've just put it back against the wall, which is where it'll end up. Um, so it doesn't actually get to make an attack, but I've kind of pushed it a little bit further forward, and it's got to enliven up. Um, the Warhog uh, charges at the... Um, Reckoner and falls short of it, but it, again, it will also activate later in the turn and probably go in and do some work. Um, the Gorax frenzied on something that, if it charged directly toward it, it bumps into the wall, so it removes its fury. Uh, the Gunbore removed its fury by frenzying on something and bumping something else. So basically, everything on the entire board has had all of the fury on it removed. And I mentioned repoing Arcadius and then just move right on to the Warhog's activation, so Evan lets me go back in a second and repo Arcadius. So. We'll, uh, we'll show that in a moment. Apologies to our viewers for that particular mistake. Uh, and we walk in with the Warhog. Now, a couple of times the Warhog rolls fours to hit, and we count them as misses, but they actually are hits because of Primal, which I'd forgotten. Oh, yeah. So, so the mi minor catch, but I, I think it, it results in two attack rolls that missed instead of th they should have hit. So... We're, we're calculating what I need to hit and do for damage. Um, I think the the gore, which is the first attack, is dice plus five. Because uh, it's POW 15 and has six points of armor swing on it. So it goes to 21. No, is it? So the gore, I believe, is plus four and the axe is plus five. So, I'm sorry. So it's got ruin for two, primal for two, force evo for two. So that's six. So it goes to POW 21. No, wait. And I'm missing one? You're missing the plus two from the aggression, aggression dial. dial. Aggression dial. So you're at 23, which is plus four, and then the axes are plus one pow from the gore, so they're yep. plus five. You take a massive chunk out of the, the painted reckoner, or the, well, the, the beige reckoner. Yep. Um, all of the models are painted. Yeah. Just that so one looks more painted because it's not painted white. <laughs> feature of our channel. So again, that's a four to hit that I interpret as a miss. Um, basically, what I end up doing is I, I take out the Cortex on the first Reckoner and choose to split damage over to the other Reckoner. Um, I would have gotten maybe two more attacks, and they are dice plus a fair bit. So it's possible I would have taken out you know another aspect or two or possibly finished one of the jacks. But not not to worry. Uh, I do an enormous amount of damage to both jacks. And that's uh, that's a fairly... Fairly decent chunk here. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, they're both very hurt. Like, the, the the one closer to the top side of the board is missing its melee side. The one closer to the bottom is missing its gun side. Pretty uh, pretty big deal. Um, the uh, Arcadius repo has been corrected now. You see him kind of hide up behind that building. Uh, and we start with the Roadhog, who makes a one-handed throw. Uh, we both roll sixes. Ty goes to the attacker. Um, and we're both strength 11, so I get to throw the Templar straight away. Yeah. Uh, lands on the, uh, the friendly little vassal, um, which gives it plus two armor and makes it <laughs> unable to be knocked down. So it is not knocked down from the throw. Uh, because as soon as it is contacted by the Templar, it can't be knocked down, Correct. which is a fun little interaction. Sure is. Uh, and then it also doesn't die to the damage. Yeah, I think I, I boost damage on the Templar and do, I, I think, nothing. And then I don't boost damage on the Vassal, and I roll a 3. That's a total of 14, which means it actually is totally fine. Mm -hmm. uh, however, um, important feature, I managed to clear off this flag because everything's away from it now, and I run a Gremlin Storm up to be able to score the four points that I previously talked about. So one, two, three on the flags, four in the zone, contesting Evan's zone with that Warhog, ship the turn, that is now top of three. So uh, I do some vengeance moves, this one moves in and smacks the Warhog, hits like a ton of bricks, thanks to uh, Master of Ruin, thanks Hermit, and also Sevi Zero. So uh, I also roll an 11, which helps for damage. So we just do a, a truckload of damage. Uh, and then we also do our vengeance moves with Roven and Co. Um, we can't actually get any attacks in due to just where things are. Um, but I move into a position where I can charge the Warhog later in the turn and just do a bunch of damage. I think we rewind in a second and resolve the continuous fire. Yes, we uh, we do end up doing that as well. Um it ends up doing no damage. <laughs> the fire, I think, kills the Repenter. Oh, sorry. My Repenter's... Yes, sorry. Uh, yes, the Repenter does die. Um, 
the old uh, who knows what happens in the control and the maintenance phase question. Yes. Um, that little move there is an enliven move. I keep the Reckoner in my melee range, but I just tuck a little bit over. I didn't have the ability with the enliven move to get out of the ruin, which is what I would have liked mm -hmm. to do. I was actually kind of hoping to have killed one of these jacks so I could do that with the enliven move, but... Um, and and who knows if that would have happened with the extra couple of hits there? Uh, I, either way, it's um, it's not the end of the world. We've, I've made more important mistakes in games that happened at top tables of tournaments. So there there comes a point in time where you just have to acknowledge that mistakes happen. So uh, this turn is the tank turn. This is the I am down for nothing on scenario, and it's sudden death mode. How do I get out of this? So looking at the table, I have two options. I can go for a super janky, probably not likely assassination on Arcadius, or now that all of Arcadius's pieces are on my side of the table, I can just try to kill the entire army and just have more pieces that can score and contest so that that scenario lead never comes to fruition. So that there's never going to be a point in the game where I lose on scenario because there are no pieces that can just do it. It's a lot of confidence for someone down four points right now. Uh, I mean, like, <laughs> that's an explanation of a plan. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's not very... Let's just say <laughs> that <laughs> I'm, I sound confident. I don't feel confident. Yeah, this is the, like, okay... Let's abandon the likelihood question and just say, wh how could this work? Exactly. Like, what string of events would have to happen to, to keep me in this game? Yeah, because I have a jack between the two Reckoners I have. I have Scourge of Heresy, who can just kill whatever he looks at. And I have a Templar that's basically fine, but has to spend a, a focus to shake. So where do we put our focus that makes this happen? Well, we have to kill all three Jack, or not Jacks. I mean, they're half Jack, the, the pigs on the top side of the zone, or the board. So we have to kill all three of those. Okay. We have to kill the Warhog that's in our zone so that we can score a point. Okay. We have to contest or kill the model scoring on each flag, and we have to contest the opposing zone. How do we make all these things happen? Well, it's a lot. It's a lot to have happen. Indeed. Uh, so, we just start going and making attacks, basically, is the gist of it. Uh, this is the charge from Rovan & Co. They're not going to be able to get anywhere else on the board. They only have one target, so they're going to go after it. Rovan & Co. are just trucking down this Warhog. Uh, they manage to finish it off. Mm -hmm. And then I Battle Wizard a... Uh, Immolation, I believe it is, onto the Hermit. I want to say Cleansing Fire. The Cleansing Fire. That is what it's called. Immolation is on Sefi Zero. I, I uh, Battle Wizard a Cleansing Fire into the Hermit. Figure I might as well put one point on him while I can. I don't know how many attacks I'm actually going to be able to put into him this turn, so he's likely not going to die, and I'm likely just going to have to contest that flag as best I can. Often but, he's a two-turn project, right? Yeah, often. Um, definitely not planning on killing him this turn unless something crazy happens and the opportunity just happens to present itself. I'm going to put multiple jacks contesting that top side. Uh, we're just going to try to kill everything. And then one of the Menite Archons just has to go across the table. Um, so this is the uh, the Enliven move uh, from... What would you hit him with? Actually, sorry, I didn't put a Cleansing Fire into the Hermit. I was debating doing that, and you instead, instead did it into, into the Roadhog, road right. which triggered and enliven. It's yep. like, oh, okay, this is uh, this is good. We can do this. So I'm thinking about where I can put my Menite Archon. I'm thinking now now he has line of sight and can charge it and can get into contesting range of the flag and maybe do some damage to the Void Archon as well. Okay, so we have more options now. So this move was a bit of a gamble. Um I pulled the Roadhog back because I thought I'd be able to get a really sexy Guardian Beast move with it, um, which I might have overestimated the value of. 
Um, Arcadius is kind of back behind the flag with Guardian Beast. I thought Evan might send a Void Ar or a Menite Archon forward, and I'm thinking to myself, like, with a combination of Dark Shroud and Ruin and a fully boosted attack, I might just be able to, like, steal a Menite Archon from him. Mm -hmm. um, didn't necessarily do the math on that one. The the sort of 15-21 that we talked about before is a very robust stat line to, like, actually finish one of them. Yeah. So. so the Vassal goes, uh, puts a focus on Scourge, putting him at 3, uh, and then I repo three out of the way into contesting range. I'm looking at the table. I, I've now I'm going to or have already. It's hard to tell with all the different models there, but um, battled my my battle group. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Your battled group. Yeah. My battled group. Yes, uh, we're proxying out the the Menite Archon and where he can go and if he can contest and also. Uh, have the Void Archon in his engagement range. The Menad Archon uh, does have Repo 3, so this isn't like a critical measurement. It's just like a yeah. thing. Uh, an awesome to. feature of this theme is yeah. that Solos gain Repo 3, which includes Menad Archons, which is maybe silly. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're very good. They're, they have a lot of a lot of nasty tools. Yeah. Um, they're also like, you know, they cost the same amount as that um, Repenter we talked about before, right? That's true. And they're, they're, they're in some ways quite a bit less durable, right? They have half yes. the boxes. Yes. Not quite half the boxes. <laughs> a little, little more than that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at how we can do that. Hierophant goes up, gives me Harmonious Exaltation. In this current plan, I'm thinking instead of just putting the Menite Archon into the Roadhog, the Menite Archon's going to go charge it and then put its valuable attack into the Void Archon and just try to kill it because um, it, it, it's surprisingly good at that with Divine Inspiration. Mm-hmm. And then the Reckoner is going to finish off the Roadhog. And then, you know, that clears up the flag. Maybe even the Menite Archon can repo in and score it or something like that. Who knows? Options are open at this point. But before any of that happens, you uh, you feet, right? Yes. Resnick feats, walks up, boundless charges that Reckoner um, so that it can get, get to where it needs to go. Uh, and then, now that Resnick has moved, we have room to battle. Aha! We planned this out. We know how this game works. Um... Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Move the, the important things, battle some stuff, um, make sure everyone's in command range and such. That Max Choir, they're, uh, they're sometimes a little difficult to manage. Yeah. Uh, get them out of the way afterwards. The Repo and Choir is a really cool theme benefit. It I've is. I've always been a big fan of that. It is fantastic. So, we do that. We go in with the Templar. The Templar only has one focus. He's not charging. He's just getting into melee range with all of the things. And he's going to pile his attacks into the already damaged Warhog. Yeah, this Warhog uh, took that 10 damage shot and then got psychosurgery. So he's at, I think, 22 boxes at this stage. Yeah. So the Templar has two pound 19 attacks. That's a, a flail and a bot flail. And then also a pow 15 shield attack because Sevi Zero is far, far away at this point. First flail attack does a massive chunk of damage, which is nice. I'm choosing not to beat back on any of these just because I don't want to get in Scourge's way at the end of this. Uh, and then we just happen to, to clean this Warhog's clock, and he is gone, uh, which means he explodes. So his friend next to him, the Gunbore, takes a POW 17 fire damage roll because Resnick himself is in Sevi Zero's range, and Resnick is rolling the damage. Uh, does six damage to him. Great. Good little start from the pretty, Templar there. Pretty all right. All right. Great. So we've cleared out the Warhog, which gives Scourge room to walk in and put some damage in. So we're just walking our four, which puts us in four inches of the flag. And in melee range of the... Um the Roadhog, importantly. Yes, both the Roadhog and the Gun Boar. So we're, we're putting all our attacks into the Roadhog, at least to start. Uh, we're with the, with, um, the Punisher, I believe it's called. It's <laughs> dice plus two. His weapons are so like cartoonishly about murdering people. Yes. The Punisher and the Blazing Star. Yeah. Sounds like something you're going to report, Carbon. You did very well. <laughs> the Blazing Star. <laughs> <laughs> um, long story short, the Scourge of Heresy kills the Roadhog with one focus remaining. <laughs> blows blows up. it up, does a ton of damage to the gun bore, puts its last attack with the Punisher into the gun bore, and then at dice plus four, kills the gun bore as well. So... 
typically speaking, you don't get a lot of work out of Resnick's feet against War Beast and War Jack centric lists. Uh, there's an example of how you can. <laughs> yep. And then, since the Midnight Archon has done his job of buffing the fire damage rolls against that gun bore twice, he charges the Void Archon and then gets Guardian Beast. Oh no. Rar. Uh, thankfully, this puts the Roadhog back into Master of Ruin range. Yeah. I don't know. This may, may or may not have been an amazing choice. Uh, so I do need, um, I think, a 9 to hit you, which is not irrelevant. Uh, it's boosted from Guardian Beast. So here, here comes a 9. Dot, dot, dot. She says with great anticipation. Uh, that hits. Yep, that's that's a 10, actually. Uh, and then my attack is POW 15, which goes to effective 19, which is dice minus 2. So I could kill, but probably don't kill here. Um, I do, I think, n- 7 six, points of damage? 6 or six seven, 7, something like that. Yeah. Charge attack hits the Void Archon. Uh, thanks to Master of Ruin, this is dice plus 4? Because I'm a 17 goes down to a 15 and you're a 19? Uh, something along. Something it's, like that. It's, a, it's a silly number. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's the m- gist of it damage. is the Void Archon dies. It does indeed. And, and then, then you get to put your next attack into the Roadhog. It explodes, does a ton of damage to the Roadhog, and then the, the Flail goes into the Roadhog. The Flail has Grievous Wounds, so it's Ooh. grievously wounded. And does a good chunk of damage, if I'm not mistaken, just because, again, Righteous Vengeance is a awesome rule. Uh, and it's dice minus one, I believe. Yeah, so that that's more damage than I maybe give credit for. You are not in position to repo into the zone, which is a big deal. And because you've taken six damage, you, you have, I think, only six boxes left. Uh, or, no, nine, nine, boxes. nine nine boxes. boxes left. They have fifteen boxes. So they're a little, he's a little battered, which is uh, yeah, you know, it's worth something. I'm just barely out of range of repoing in the zone, which causes some issues, unfortunately. But you thought about like I'll take a free strike and get into the zone, but decided instead to just can't because you can't quite. You're just <laughs> just out of three there. All right, so now we want to kill this roadhog because we're just so close. We might as well anyway. But also we have to contest. This flag somehow, so I'm like, okay, Midnight Archon can go into the. You also void. don't have anything in my zone yet, so exactly. I think that ends up being the job of the Midnight Archon is to charge the Roadhog and repo into right. the zone. Right. So I was considering putting it in the void. Can't because now, like the the only way I can contest the zone is if I charge, kill the Roadhog, or even just charge, hit the Roadhog, and then repo in with the Midnight Archon, um, because the Reckoner can't go far enough. You do, for the record, kill the Roadhog and I repo do. into the zone. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the worst feeling contest model ever. <laughs> I have nothing that can contest this flag. You'll see me proxy Severius Zero. You'll see me measure some other stuff. But uh, we end up having to run the full focus, boundless charged Reckoner <laughs> in order to contest this flag and not lose. I mean, not losing is basically step one to winning. It's, yes. This is a, I guess you're not wrong, but uh, this is this is a feel bad. This is a feel bad moment. <laughs> yeah, it smacks of maybe some poor planning, but, but you know, things things sort of shook out a little bit differently than you thought because of some out of activation movements and some some kind of goofiness that happened in this turn. So you actually did, did quite well in making the comeback. Um, and I... I mean, I'm still, like, at a three-point scenario lead, which is very strong. But that's harder to manage with all of my heavies dead. Because now I'm down both Warhogs, both Roadhogs. You have two lights. I have two, three lights? Gorax, Gunbore. Down to a Gorax and a Gunbore. It's much less of a battle grip than it was a moment ago. So, yeah, you again, we, we think about this for a while, and then we're like, this... This is the only option. Yeah. So we run, and we run, and we cry, and we run. And we can test the flag! Yay! And then Sevi, the useless jerk, moves to so that he can contest it next turn instead. <laughs> so one of the things that I like about the Void Archons is that they collect a lot of souls and get a lot of stuff even as your pieces die. Um, Resnick's Feet has done a very, very good job of counterplaying that because I have not collected any souls 
uh, other than the very, very first one from my heavy that died. Uh, I throw out an immolation on the hermit to do a point to him, so I guess he has four boxes now. I think the uh, the other Reckoner shot him once, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, we maybe did two damage yeah, to he him. Has, he has three boxes left now, so mm -hmm. certain values of good. But uh, with that, we score a single point, and you don't score anything this turn. It's a pivotal single point, though. It's a very important Indeed. one. Indeed. So yeah. what is the plan? So I think about a couple of plans, and this is sort of one of the problems with complexity. I think about maybe the Void Archon just goes incorporeal and runs past the Reckoner into your zone to contest. Like, maybe that's a good use of its abilities. Um, maybe I go up and, and do a bunch of damage to that Reckoner. Like, maybe that's what he ends up doing. Um, I, as I say, I workshop a couple of different options. Uh, step one is the the Hermit walks forward, and he tags all three of those models with Ruin while staying on the flag. Now my goal is I have to contest and score two, or um, not contest and score three. Those ones feel pretty comfortably this far flag by killing the Reckoner, my zone by killing an Archon, and the uh, the center flag by killing an Archon. That gives me the three points. So that's the, the whole goal of this plan. Um, so I walk to the other side of the melee range of the Reckoner, never leaving its melee with the, the Void Archon. Uh, I make a melee attack, and with the combination of Dark Shroud and Ruin, it ends up hitting at power 17. Dice minus 2 does quite a bit of damage to the already banged up Reckoner. Uh, and then my second melee attack, I boost damage. Now, this might have been a mistake, um, but I boost damage and I actually finish the Reckoner with a pretty solid roll. I then take a spray, a Wrath 6 spray, that tags three models. I'm really hoping to kill one of these and be able to teleport to the zone. I hit Ga Ca Gaius or Cassius or whatever his name is, uh, miss Severius, and I miss, importantly, the... Um, you, you hit the vessel. I hit the vessel. I'm sorry. I hit the vessel. You, uh, you do one damage. No, I think I missed the vessel. No. Oh, I guess this, the spray's power 14. Yeah, no, you missed yeah, the vessel. I missed the vessel. Yeah. So that means I don't contest the zone, and I continue executing the turn as though I had for a minute, and that causes me a little bit of issue later in the turn. We'll, we'll go over that in a moment. Yep, forcing me to dig a little deeper. Uh, the Witch Dark Croc just simply runs to the flag, so he's going to be my scoring piece, and now we're up to uh, one of the three pieces that need to die dead, and I have two... Uh, mana archons to, to deal with. Now, they're obviously quite scary pieces, so we'll see how that goes. Um, the Gorax activates, and I make a couple mistakes here. The Gorax probably should have primaled himself. Uh, instead, he boosts at his first attack, getting a 10. Uh, he hits with it, so we opt to boost damage. Uh, the Gorax is POW 12, and I roll pretty well for the first damage roll. Uh, POW 12, I roll a 14, so that's 26. You're a, a 19, drops down to 17, so that's uh, 9 points. I think I should kill him. Oh, well. We screwed it up. That's fine. Um, minus 6. Because mm. he was the great POW 11. Beast did one. Gorax is POW 12. Gorax is POW 9. POW 9? Strength 9. But I have... I oh, you know. punched me. Yeah. Anyway, not not spectacularly important. I think we forgot that this Archon wasn't at full health from the Guardian Beast attack, so he, he doesn't die here right away. But um, he does uh, die to um, a Primal Shock. Arcadius walks over and Primal Shocks him and finishes him off after crippling grasping him. So... Probably ended up spending about six more focus on killing him than I should have. Which, now that I think about it, is maybe an important mistake here. <laughs> oh, well. Um, I thought he did, he only did like, he did five damage. Five damage? Yeah. The Grax? Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe. Anyway, per perhaps. Uh, either way, the, uh, the either we messed up tracking damage correctly in the uh, Arc Archon here, in which case I should have had some more resources, or we didn't, and I spent most of Arcadius' stack finishing him off. Um, either way, you can let us know in the comments below. We either screwed it up, or we're screwing it up commentary right now. Six of one, half dozen the other. So this is the moment where, um, forgivably or not forgivably, I'm now in a situation where I've already activated Arcadius, he's used his little needle to poke the Gorax, and then unexpectedly killed the, uh, the Archon that I hadn't tracked damage very well on or thought very much about how close it was to dying. I spent my stack and I haven't given any buffs to the gun bore. So I'm down to gun bore, boom howler, um, 
Targ, who really doesn't have a great place to ancillary attack because he's too far away from the gun bore, and the Gorax already killed his target, uh, and a Gremlin Swarm. And the Gremlin Swarm, I really want to run into Evan's zone, but of course, Scourge of Heresy has magic weapons, so I can't run through it. Um, so I start thinking about what I can proxy out, because if I can run the Gremlin Swarm to Evan's zone, I've already won the game. Uh, if I can kill this Archon, I also win the game. So I've got two points of um, ability to kind of win pretty effectively here, but I might be um, unable to access either of them, which is a pretty pretty important moment. So we start going into the tank a little bit, thinking about what tools I have for that. Uh, I think I take Quack and Gub, and I spray the Archon twice. Uh, and because I um, kind of mismanaged this particular activation a little bit, thinking that I need to spray both of them, that was the plan originally. Um, instead of you know moving him back and just spraying from outside of Ashenvale range, I walk him into Ashenvale range. So my magic ability drops down to functionally five. I need eights to hit, and I miss both of the venoms. So I've been pow twelve venoms. So that would be a good thing to not kind of rush into and make that mistake. Another example of when you're kind of there's a kind of overconfidence that comes of being like in a pretty ahead position where I'm making. Um, like a series of, of sort of spiraling minor errors, like little mistakes that, you know, not attending to the right thing, not thinking about how much resource you have to allocate to something, just kind of little tiny planned moments where I feel like I'm so far ahead that it doesn't matter if I make this particular mistake. And it, it, it does. I mean, War Machine is a game of uh, minutia sometimes, like little tiny details. Uh, here we're measuring the run of that Gremlin Swarm, um, just where it needs to run to stay out of Melee of Scourge, come around past Scourge's melee, and then run as directly as it can toward that zone. And it feels like it's maybe a quarter of an inch out, so I'm just trying to tighten that line as much as possible, measure as directly as possible, and we get to a point where it becomes clear that it is out by... Millimeters. Millimeters. Not even a quarter of an inch. But enough to be definitively out. I'd, I'd say the amount that a spray template 10 is longer than 10 inches. More than that. A little bit more than that. <laughs> And so that's, that's an easy solve to this problem that I don't have access to. So now I'm starting to scramble a little bit. I've done all the Arcadius things, and, you know, hindsight being 2020, Arcadius could have primaled the gun bore, and he could have put forced Evo on it to put another four points of damage into that situation, and plus two Matt, which would have been a lot for that gun bore, who then could have made its two initials and bought three attacks, uh, all of them at Matt seven instead of Matt five. He's looking for eights. Five cracks at an eight feels a lot better than what he's going to have, which is maybe two cracks at a ten. I, I think about a few things, like uh, if Boomhaller could walk out of melee, his gun has a uh, crit knockdown. Um, Boomhaller could take a couple shots at that t uh, Scourge, try to knock it down and let the Gremlin Swarm run into the zone. Or he has beat back on the same gun. He could take a couple shots at the, the Menite Archon and beat it back out of the zone. But unfortunately, he's engaged in melee right now, and I do the math on the odds that he survives a free strike from a Menite Archon, and it's very, very poor. Uh, it's also worth noting that because the Menite Archons themselves are warrior models, this Menite Archon has gotten plus two strength and armor from the other Menite Archon dying. Correct. So we're in a spot now where it's starting to get a little tricky. And there's a lot of tools by which I could have probably done a better job of solving this problem, and I don't. So we hope to get lucky. We boost to hit, and we boost damage. So the gun bore's first attack. Uh, he's only 11. Crushes uh, the damage roll. But he just rolls a 665, which is pretty good. Um, what that does mean, though, is, uh, you know, at, at 11, you're at 21, drops down to a 19 because of ruin. I'm at 11. That means I'm dice minus 8. Uh, I get to do 7 points of seven points of damage. No, dice minus 8, and I rolled a 665 is nine points of damage. I do nine points of damage. He buys a second attack. Uh, he misses the second, or pardon me, he boosts the second attack, misses that. Boom Howler uh, gets three inches of movement and charges in. Uh, he needs to roll a six on the table and he misses his charge attack. Boom Howler's Matt seven, but again, with Ashenvale, he needs to roll an eight to hit. <sighs> that would have been a POW 14 attack, a dice minus seven that, you know, might add another three and a half or four damage. You've taken nine. It's within the realm of possibly finishing you. Very, very close. I'm definitely regretting not primaling and forced evoing that uh, <laughs> that one uh, gun bore. Uh, so you're looking at the 
uh, grid for Scourge because you're sabotaging him with the yep. Gremlin Swarm. Yeah, the Gremlin Swarm does the the six damage with Scourge and prevents, or pardon me, six damage with sabotage and prevents Scourge from being healed. Um, probably not the best choice here because I've ultimately have given Evan the ability to proc uh, Scourge's bond. Um, I pull Targ back to contesting range of the flag. Uh, I could have run this Gremlin Swarm to like a spot to maybe potentially block a landing zone or something weird, but again, I'm I'm panicking a little bit. I'm in a spot this turn where I'm just trying to find a way to not have Arcadius just die right here. It's another turn where I initially forgot to repo Arcadius, and I'd feel a lot safer if I'd repoed behind that building. Yeah. It was, after all, on his activation that the Primal Shock finished the Archon. Indeed. Yeah, so uh, there's there no reason not to be a little bit further back. I'm even in my own Ruin range, which is a, a foolish place to be. Yeah, that, uh, that makes him armor 12? 15-12. 15-12. Uh, yeah, so so like so many things in this turn that could have clicked it in for me. I'm, I've left Evan in a situation where he scored one point at the bottom of my turn, and I scored two points, which put the, the scoring situation uh, six to two. So again, I have, I have a four-point lead, and I could have done a lot of things to, to lock that up. Mm. Um, so we're just kind of doing, doing the things that will let us kill Arcadius. So... Uh, I allocate three to Scourge. Resnick's going to move up and kill this Gremlin Swarm for me so that I can proc the bond and make a full advance with Scourge towards Arcadius. I'm even going to Boundless Charge him just because. Might as well get the free charge before I go in with Scourge, though. I am going to charge with the Mana Archon. Uh, repo back a little with uh, Resnick. Not in curse. You're not range. in curse range, which was the other thing you're checking. You're like, yeah, how 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 guaranteed can I make this? Uh, Templar just runs over here, um, and then the Menadarkon, uh, who is, um, mad. Yeah, he's he's righteous vengeance and stuff. Quackengub don't have a melee attack, so he just flies over uh, the Gunbore, who he's still in the melee range of. Um, makes an attack on Arcadius, and he hits his charge attack, and just cranks the damage. I think he does like. 13 points of damage or something to my armor 12 caster with no transfers. Yep. And his second initial attack misses. also needing an eight misses. Yep. Misses. Uh, um, charge from scourge for free boost to hit the charge attack connects. And I think automatically kills yeah, Arcadius. without rolling dice. We'll take out Arcadius. And that's our game. That, that is indeed our game. So there's a lot going on here. I mean, you can see some of the really cool transformational tools in Evan's list, how powerful those men archons are and how ultimately quite tanky they are. Um, you can also see a lot of the incredible killing power in the Arcadius list. And I think, um, I think there's some profound lessons about like list play here. I do not feel like I just fundamentally misplayed the list and as a result lost the game. I think I made a lot of good, clever decisions at moments that put me in a really strong advantageous position and then got a little overconfident in that moment and didn't capitalize on the many, many tools that are available. So you got to see, I think kind of maybe both parts of good Arcadius of Arcadius play, should I say? You got to see like fairly strong capitalization and then you got to see not making use of your tools sufficiently to solve everything adequately yeah the thing about arcadius is that he has a large toolkit and he needs to use all of said tools precisely or else your army disintegrates and you have fewer tools yeah Some, sometimes even no tools yeah <laughs> yeah and that's that's what the end of that game went i was just kind of feeling overconfident like i could delete anything that was in front of me and evan put things in front of me that didn't just melt so that was uh it was, it was a good, it's a good execution. Really interesting, and uh, you know, Menoth had the sort of keep on chugging tortoise and hare approach to the game, which is, um, I think, more effectively implemented when you've got a caster who can leverage that really powerful initial gunline element. Mm -hmm. Anyways, folks, thank you very much for watching, and we will see you next week.